Thank you very much. I'm humbled by that introduction. Everyone had a good evening so far? Yeah. Okay, this is a hip hop on the stage now, so you can make a little more noise than that. I said, has everyone had a good evening so far? Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, part of one, what I want to talk about today is hip hop. You know, what is hip hop? How is hip hop defined? Who defines hip hop and how it's understood? I've been lucky enough to travel all around the world, as was mentioned in the introduction, and see places from Rio de Janeiro, you know, to parts of the Middle East, to New Zealand, to Sudan, that this cultural power that hip hop has, particularly the art of rapping, rhythmically rhyming over the beat of a drum, being an MC, as we call it. I don't necessarily mean the most visible elements of hip hop, the ones that are most commercially viable to some, I mean the culture of hip hop, the stomach of hip hop, the spirit of hip hop. And for me, for that to be properly understood, Africa Bambata being the founding father of hip hop, we have to go back and really understand what are the roots of this culture. But to get any accurate sense of the culture of people of African origin in the Americas, we must have some accurate sense of the cultures that they left, which I think there are so many misconceptions that still persist. So before we can move into hip hop and the music side, we're going to have a five minute history lesson. This here is a picture drawn in 1668 by a Dutchman named Ofer Dapper. This is the city of Luango in what is today the Congo. This was the capital city of the Congolese Empire at the time. As you can see, clear evidence of city planning, straight streets, paved roads. There's a wall that rings the city. Very, very large wall that goes around the outside, horse and carriage, etc. This is 1668, the city of Luango. This was also drawn by Mr. Ofer Dapur. Same year, 1668. This is Benin in what is now today Nigeria. The procession dominating the foreground is the procession of the Oba or king. But if you look in the background, you can see a similar sort of city structure and with the same uh, facility of a, a wall around the outside. And in fact, the Great Wall of Benin, as we could call it, is in the 1974 Guinness Book of World Records as the largest earthworks carried out prior to the mechanical era. Please uh, check that entry for yourself. There are many sort of uh, monuments like this in this part of Western Africa. In fact, the largest monument in Nigeria is a thing called Songbo Eredo. I don't have a picture of it because it's not a particularly attractive picture like these ones. It's actually a moat that's 20 meters wide, 70 meters down at its height, and it's dug around an area of 400 square miles. You can still go and see it today. It took a million more tons of cubic dirt earth to be removed to do that than it did to build the Great Pyramid in Egypt, for example, to give a sense of the scale of building. People of this region of this time were producing art like this, fine metal art like this. This piece is actually in the British Museum. You can go and see it. I have done. Or the Benin bronzes, as these are called. Some of these are also in the British Museum. Pablo Picasso cited much of this art as a great source of inspiration for him, to give an example. This is Great Zimbabwe in what today is Zimbabwe. I've also been lucky enough to go here. A couple of slides of this. The outer wall comprising 100,000 tons of granite bricks held together without any mortar. This was built in around the 14th century. This is a knight from the Cain and Borno Empire, which would be part of what is Libya today and Chad and Cameroon, that sort of region. As you can see, no loincloth. He's wearing quilted metal armor. This is 16th century. Some more art, Nigerian metal art from the similar period. This is a gate from the palace of Zaria, Hausa, again, 16th century. Again, a monument you can go and see. This is drawn by Dr. Henry David Bath, an English traveler in this region. This is the 16th century city of Agades, in part of what is the Songhai Empire. The city at this period of time had 70,000 inhabitants, which for that period of history is quite a lot of inhabitants. But that wasn't the largest city in Western Africa in the period. This was Timbuktu, and this is the Mosque of Jene, which also served as a university. This is what it looks like inside. It's what it looks like outside again. This is the most famous ruler pictured here with the king of the Moors. The man on the camel is the king of the Moors at the time, or the ruler of the Moors, should I say. And the man sitting down holding the golden nugget is Mansa Musa I. There was actually an article in some of the British papers this week about uh, that historians had adjusted for inflation, the richest man of all time. And this gentleman was estimated to be that. It's debatable how much one individual being so rich is a massive historical achievement, but it gives you a sense of the history of that period of time. This is a private collection of books from Mauritania, dating from the period, the height of the Timbuktu. Uh, this is another manuscript from Timbuktu. In fact, in Timbuktu and in and around Mali, there are 700,000, I'm going to repeat that, 700,000 manuscripts surviving from this period of history on everything from art to mathematics, philosophy, etc. In fact, this piece right here was featured in a program uh, Michael Palin presented called Sahara. As you can see, it shows the phases of the moon. The issue with it is the manuscript is about 150 years older than the birth of Galileo or Copernicus. So it raises some issues about the history of science. This gentleman here is really what I want to focus on. What were the structure of these societies? They were caste-based societies, societies in which 
uh, your, your inheritance was your work. So the metal workers would be a caste of families. Warriors would be a caste of families. And this gentleman here is what is known as a griot. A griot was a poet, musician, singer, all of which you had to train for, but was also, in some senses, a political advisor. In other senses, a genealogist, a historian. They were charged with memorizing literally thousands of poems, if that sounds like any kind of exaggeration. A very good friend of mine, Sona Jabate, is a direct descendant of this griot tradition. She lives in London, actually. But her grandfather knows poems off by heart that are three, four, five hours long, some of them. Some of these have been published. The epic of Sonjata, for example, has been published. People can read that, but it's a, it's a poem that many people had to memorize that retells the founding of the Malian Empire by Sanjata Keita. And so the ways in which these different traditions, I suppose, manifested in the Americas is various according to the political and social context that people found themselves in, is how much culture they were able to maintain. Somewhere like northeastern Brazil, the Yoruba spiritual and cosmological worldview is very visible today in Brazil. You can see it in Bahia for any of those that have been. I've been lucky enough to go there on New Year's Eve and witness people celebrating this religion still. It's the most visible religion in that region. Somewhere like Haiti, also another example of that. In other places, the situation is a little more ambiguous, the ways in which the cultures manifested themselves. And we want to talk about a few of these places and see how it relates to this art form that I love so much, hip hop. The first place I want to talk about is a place called Congo Square in New Orleans, which is in Louis Armstrong Park in New Orleans. This place is considered to be officially the birthplace of jazz music. But why Congo Square? Why not somewhere else? Well, part of the history of Congo Square is that in the early 1800s, it was one of the few places in the Americas that Africans had Sunday off. Sounds simple enough, but what this meant was people gathered, hundreds of people gathered from all the different parts of the African continent and celebrated their culture in a way that wasn't possible in many other parts of the Americas at the time. We fast forward a little further to the 1860s, you have a period of American history called the Reconstruction, during which period in certain parts of the Americas you already had integrated neighborhoods. Many of us don't realize that today. You already had African-American governors in certain positions of government. You already had people voting, African-Americans voting in certain parts of the South. Back then, many of the most prominent scientists and inventors from the period, people like Elijah McCoy, were of African origin. In the 1890s, a lot of this relative progress was brought to a halt quite violently under Jim Crow. And this uh, political kind of tumultuous period of time, along with the cultural roots of a place like Congo Square, gives us jazz music. Interestingly enough, almost a century later, hip hop would be born in very, very similar circumstances. But I'm not just concerned with the political and social context given birth to these musics, but also the cultural characteristics of them. What, how much has been continued into hip hop? As I said, hip hop culture, not necessarily the most visible elements that we see on our television. So in jazz music, you had artists like Cab Calloway, who as a dancer was the main influence on James Brown. James Brown was then the main influence, not only on Michael Jackson, but also on early B-boy break dancing hip hop, people like Crazy Legs. But what Cab Calloway also did, he published a dictionary of what they call hip slang. People of African origin like to mess with the languages that, they, that they've inherited. That's sometimes demonized quite a lot, but put back in the context of people who've had their languages removed, it makes perfect sense. And much of the slang that people inject into the English language is very demonstrably African in its rhythm and its tonality, Jamaican patois being the most well-known example of that. So Cab Calloway published dictionaries of slang, he was also a poet. But I want to play you a series of videos that I think say far more eloquently than I could the journey that this character, the MC, has gone on. So this first video right here is from 1937, because a lot of people tell us people began rhythmically rhyming over the beat of a drum, rapping in the 1970s. Well, what you're going to see here is people rapping in 1937, I give you the Golden Gate Quartet. That isn't good enough for me. Well, the preacher fell down on his knees and sent up a great long prayer. While they cast one eye way up towards the hip, he kept the other on the bear. He said, Lord, look here, you know you delivered old Daniel from a lion's den. And you delivered three Hebrew children from a fire furnace. Very short clip. Can we have a round of applause for the Golden Gate Quartet, please? Now, for anyone that's heard the rap song Rapper's Delight, that's 1937, right? For anyone who's heard that song, you'll know, you know what that joke is. Now, this next woman I'm going to play is one of the greatest singers from the African-American tradition. But she's not usually someone who's associated with the art of emceeing. But what you're going to see here is her doing something called scatting. And the rhythmic, tonal nature of it that is more similar to rapping than to singing will be very clear. I'll give you Ella Fitzgerald. Shouldn't get a little bit 
Round of applause for Ella Fitzgerald, please. Now, for those of us that are UK-based MCs, I mean, that sounds a lot like grime. You put words in there, and that's kind of fast grime speed rapping. This next gentleman, I'm sure you all know, and if you don't, I'll be very, very disappointed. But uh, this program is a, is a program I suggest you go, go and look up. It has many of the great hip-hop artists, because I don't want to pretend anything I'm saying here today is original. The founders of hip-hop said this. In fact, the very word hip-hop comes from the wall of verb hippie which means to open your eyes and see, hop from the English signifying movement. Hip hop is thus defined by KRS-One, Africa Bamba and others as intelligent movement. That's what the culture is defined as, right? But this video here is people from that culture paying homage again to a gentleman who's not necessarily usually associated with these traditions, but certainly was a massive impact on them. I'll give you the incomparable Muhammad Ali. Some people say, you better watch Joe Frazier. He's awful strong. I said, tell him to try band roll on. After we get the band, we will go after the hair. Give me five. We'll okay, give you 30, but your face is too dirty. I'm a poet. I'm a prophet. I'm the resurrector. I'm the savior of the boxing world. If it wasn't for me, the game would be dead. This is the legend of Muhammad Ali, the greatest fighter that ever will be. He talks a great deal, and he brags indeed for powerful punch. Round of applause for Muhammad Ali, please. And also for Rakim. For those, for those who are not massively into hip hop, Rakim's someone I suggest you check out. Easily, undisputably, one of the greatest MCs of all time. He's not the only hip hop artist featured in that program, but obviously we couldn't include the whole program here. And this last video I'm gonna play you before we uh, wind up is from a group that I suppose were a part of a triad in the late 60s, early 70s. Again, when we, we come back to a, a period in history where Many of the leaders of the so-called civil rights movement and African-American leaders generally have either been assassinated or in prison. You have a situation where the poet, the rapper, or as I would prefer to call it, the griot, is looked to for social guidance, is looked to to speak on behalf of the people. That sort of social significance comes back to the MC. It's not just art for art's sake. And this is summed up by people who you may know. Gil Scott Heron being the most famous person from that period of time. But there were two other artists or the other two artists were groups that I think really summed up that griot tradition and really got what it was to be a social commentator. One group was the Watts Prophets, but the other group was the group I'm about to play, The Last Poets. Selfish desires are burning like fires among those who hoard the gold as they continue to keep the people asleep and the truth from being told. A racism and greed will keep the people in need from getting what's right for theirs. Cheating, stealing, and double dealing as they exploit the people's fears. And now Dow Jones owns the people's homes and all the surrounding land, buying and selling a dear humble dwelling. Round of applause for the last poets, please. And all of what I've just played you predates by quite some years the supposed founding of rap music. A lot of the documentaries we see start the story in 1970-something as if some sort of cultural accident happened. Ooh, people just started rhyming. Um, and of course, that's not the case. There's a long cultural genesis that has given birth to this art. What really happened in the 70s with all of these traditions merged with, again, another period of Caribbean immigration into the Americas, particularly from Jamaica. And Caribbean sound system culture is at the root of what we call hip-hop. In fact, the three founding fathers of hip-hop, if you like, Africa Bambata, called DJ Herc, and Grandmaster Flash, are all Caribbean immigrants. And so this culture they brought with them, mixing with the traditions that were already there, give us what we call hip-hop. And to me, it's this long tradition, this historical genesis, whether people are conscious of it or not, whether people understand it or not, it's hip-hop culture, not, like I said, the visible, necessarily materialistic uh, extraction of it, but the culture, what it has to say, its function in society. Like any great art form, this is, none of this is exclusive to this narrative. All art forms have a history. It's this, to me, that gives hip-hop that power. So I'm going to leave you with a little piece of my own that I think touches on uh, the subject of hip-hop and rounds up some of what uh, we've seen today. It goes like this. We claim we're loving this hip-hop. Are we ready to understand it in this fullest cultural sense? Beyond this useless branding, beyond the stories that keep feeding us the common myth that people started rapping in the 70s. What a bunch. Shh. Done with the talk, loving New York for impact on my heart. But let's not pretend there was no foundation to this art because KRS-One and Bam would be the first ones to say the birth of hip-hop runs far deeper within our veins. Before Cool Hurt came to New York pumping 100 watts, before the Watts Prophets, Last Poets and Gil Scott 
before there was jazz, before there was blues, before there was Cab Calloway, before the whips and ships and all the tragedy, before you stripped of knowledge of your cultural anatomy, you could be your part for generations, you're still family before there were slaves. Forget the nonsense about slave music. They must have had a cultural base to even produce it. The schools of Timbuktu, they already knew. The cycles of the planet and the motions of the moon about 150 years before Galileo check it. And medieval Benin's in the Guinness Book of Records and all of them coaches there. They had the griot speaker, a storyteller, musician, poet and history keeper who had to memorize a couple thousand oral epics, the tradition still exists today, but it could get neglected. And hip hop needs to be understood in its fullest context, not just as a product of the hood, because Miles Davis was rich and still played with that same feeling. It's that cultural memory. Go and ask Stevie Ella Fitz, Gerald Scatton's basically rapping. When you know we lost our languages, you know what has happened. So when you hear somebody rapping, the base of it is African. It ain't about excluding no one. It's just accurate because Look around, hip hop's become this global voice, but we must understand it so we can have a choice how we should use it, what we should do with it, how to teach the students. Cause Viacom is not our cultural institution, but it will use this culture for this prostitution and our destruction, anything but a solution. But the ghetto dilemma's as bad as it's ever been. People are dead, just ain't remembering roots of the rhythm and bass. Jambiers, people are sacred. We think the temple is hand that is writing. We think the pencil is if I'm uncomfortable, you shouldn't mention it. I'm superior, so watch your sentences. Don't disturb my privileged pensioners. Living off ignorance of all the members of every one of all the people we severed off. Never one of all the people we never soft. Any sum of all the cheddar we level off. Any gun, all the better. We sell it off. Cultural suicide is a necessity to get you to worship celebrity. Because people with the strong sense of themselves, good states, they will never be. Knowledge is power. Big up, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Akala. Thank you.